Hello, my name is Norma Gilgun from the Rowell and Sleeve Crib Community Twinning Group. We believe passionately in promoting local history and have commissioned a series of online lectures by historian Horace Reid. Horace has been researching his, our history in County Down since 1990. Over the years, he has compiled a wide range of richly illustrated slideshows. We are grateful to Newry Mourn Council and Choice Housing Ireland for supporting this important historical project. I shall now hand you over to Horace who will introduce the presentation. This video has as, as its title Mills and Millers in the Balnage area. So I'm going to talk uh, chiefly about the linen industry but I'll also talk about corn mills uh, windmills and water mills. The video is split into two halves. The first one deals with the linen industry when it was based at a domestic level. So I'll talk my way uh, through all the different uh, processes, all of them uh, skilled, all of them labour intensive, uh, starting with uh, planting, uh, pu putting the uh, the flax into a lint hole, uh, scutching, uh, spinning uh, and weaving, uh, work my way through those different processes. Then second uh, part of the video, I'll talk about when the linen industry uh, became factory based and what I'll do then is talk about uh, uh, Drummond S Mill near Balnehinch, uh, which was a wet spinning mill and which had a life uh, right up until after uh, the Second World War, until finally it, it was wiped out uh, by foreign competition and uh, s synthetic textiles. Now this um, <coughs> video is about mills and millers uh, in the Balnehinch area. And I'm going to talk about um, mostly about the linen industry, but I'll also talk about uh, corn mills, uh, wind mills, water mills. So I'm going to concentrate on six uh, representative uh, establishments in the Balnage vicinity. Um, <coughs> uh, four corn mills and uh, two linen mills. So Drummond S Linen Mill and Dodd's Linen Mill up at, up at Trabara. And the corn mills are one at Mocker Knock <coughs> uh, uh, and one at the bottom of uh, ch uh, the Church Road uh, in Balnehinch and then uh, uh, Silcox Mill uh, out, at, um, out, out at Raleigh and then in the middle Bal Balnehinch windmill. So uh, those, those windmills, those, those mills <coughs> uh, work on corn or they work on linen and they are powered uh, by uh, wind or water uh, or uh, by steam. So right, I'm going to talk in my way <coughs> through uh, the er early years of the linen industry in, in the 1700s, uh, when <coughs> the industry was based at farm level or at, at house level. Uh, later on in the, in the 1800s, linen becomes based in, in factories. Now, if we're talking about the 1700s and the early linen industry, we're very fortunate because in 1783, uh, a man called William Hinks did a series of prints about the linen industry in County Down and showed every last detail uh, of the diff different processes. Um, <coughs> uh, and he had a great, a great eye, for, eye for detail, as you're going to find out. So the, the first... Uh, uh, part of, of uh, uh, growing, uh, of, uh, of uh, producing linen was to plant the flax. So uh, the, the flax seed was planted in late April. And here you see uh, a farmer uh, driving a team of four, four horses, uh, pl ploughing the soil. And then behind him, uh, um, somebody with a, an apron full of flax seed, and he's, he's throwing the flax seed. And into the ploughed earth, 
and then behind them in the background you can see uh, two oxen uh, dragging uh, 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 a harrow uh, to, to get, to get the, the flaxseed uh, to dig in. Interesting thing is that uh, the farmer's wife is, is out in the fields and she's about to feed the men at lunchtime. And take a look at her, she's got uh, three kids. She's well dressed, uh, the kids are well dressed. And look what she's got on the plate uh, to feed the men in the fields. It's uh, meat and two veg. Uh, so uh, this is a, 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 far, a far farming family uh, which is doing rather well. Uh, they can manage to ru run four horses at a time. Maybe, maybe they borrowed some from a neighbour. Uh, and uh, the, w the wife is well fed, the, the kids are well fed uh, and uh, w well, well clothed. Um, th uh, the flax took 100 days uh, from, s from seeding, uh, from, from planting uh, to uh, being harvested. And about the three quarter mark, uh, the wee blue flower came out, uh, and it is it is the uh, it, it tells you that that is a flax crop uh, when, when that when that appears. And uh, the wee blue flower is the uh, was adopted as the the lo logo for Stormont uh, when 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 Stormont op opened again, and that's appropriate because uh, flax uh, was a lucrative industry. <laughs> And the, not alone did it generate uh, capital for itself, but it generated spare capital. And if you, if you want to know what uh, started the, the um, Industrial Revolution in Belfast, well, look at the linen industry, because it generated enough spare capital uh, to start the shipbuilding industry and the heavy engineering industry uh, in, in Belfast. So it's uh, appropriate that Stormont uh, ad adopted the, the wee blue flower uh, as the logo for, for Northern Ireland. Uh, flax uh, uh, grew uh, between four and uh, between three, three and three and four feet, and it, and it took a hundred days before harvesting. You didn't harvest it the way you would do hay or corn. You, you didn't do, use a sickle or a scythe. Uh, you pulled it up by the roots. So if you look at the, the barrow on the right hand side, uh, uh, you, you can see how the, the flax was pulled out, roots and all. The idea being that flax grew right down into the root. So if you wanted the longest fibre uh, for, for a weaver, uh, then you, uh, you're, you had to include the root as well. But uh, that, was a, that made harvesting uh, difficult. Uh, you had to stoop over, you, you had to uh, grab the, the stems uh, close to the ground and you had to pull like mad in, in that position. Uh, so that was uh, back-breaking work at, uh, as, it as it was des described. And you, you see the whole, uh, the whole family uh, and the extended family turn out, uh, wo women included in the, in the photo in, in the bottom right uh, with them all uh, p uh, pulling flax. Um, once you um, <coughs> pulled it, you tied it into beets, and then next thing is you, you put it into a lint hole. Uh, this is for the process of retting, uh, or uh, which is one way of, of uh, describing uh, rotting. Flax uh, um, has uh, uh, linen fibres on the outside of the stalk, and then a, a vegetable inside. So what you want to do is uh, separate the linen uh, from the vegetable inside, and you do that by a process of, of rotting. So uh, here's Hinks uh, showing uh, uh, the, the, the beets uh, going in, into the uh, lint hole and, and then uh, uh, coming back out again. Uh, so some more modern uh, photographs are actually taken in Balnenge, and you can, you can see how it's done. Uh, you, find, you find where there's a stream uh, crossing the, the farm and then, then you dam it uh, and you establish a, a, a four foot depth of, of water. Then you put, put the beets in there and you make sure uh, that they're kept under water. So uh, you see uh, behind the, the second man 
uh, uh, along, this, along the side of the lint hole uh, are a row of stones. Uh, and th those stones are to, to hold uh, the flax on, under water and, and make sure it, it, ke it keeps on uh, redding. Um, <coughs> the water has to be changed uh, every uh, four, four or five days uh, uh, to keep the redding process going. Uh, and the smell is atrocious and it's stinking and the water, the water that drains off um, will poison fish and, and, and everything else. When you take the beets out, uh, then they, they have to be stoked uh, so, so that they dry out because they, the next stage is scotching. And of course, uh, they, they have to be dry for scotching. Now again, Higgs shows us uh, uh, the very early methods of, of scotching, uh, which was uh, uh, to, to put, uh, to put a, a, a piece of flax uh, over the edge of a board and hit it with a metal blade. And what you were doing, the, the, um, the vegetable matter had separated, but it was still stuck in there. So you, ha you had to strike at this hank until all the vegetable matter came, came out and you were, you were left with, with linen fibre alone. Uh, to encourage uh, the, uh, the uh, husk uh, to come out, uh, you, you also put it through a set of uh, steel combs. Uh, and uh, and that, that process was known as hackling. Um, as you separated uh, the, the husk uh, from the pure linen, uh, you were left on the floor with a heap of what were called shows. That, that was the husks from the original flax. And the catch with the shows was that they were highly inflammable. Uh, so uh, this, this picture here wouldn't have passed uh, health and safety. Uh, everybody in the linen industry knew that you got those shows out of doors as quickly as possible because you, you had real trouble uh, if, uh, if a spark set them on fire. Uh, later on, <coughs> uh, scotching uh, became mechanised and uh, you had a, a, a factory drive and it was driving, uh, uh, it was driving blades uh, which went whirling round and you held uh, your, your beat of, of flax over the edge of the board and beat it until all the, all the vegetable matter came out. Uh, this was a dangerous uh, occupation and uh, quite, quite often people lost fingers. Uh, and sometimes they lost hands. Or if a woman was working at this and uh, she got too close to it and the blade cut her hair, uh, it would uh, pull half her face off. Uh, the, the other thing was that um, uh, this is agricultural material you're, you're working with and it's throwing up a lot of dust and you're breathing this dust in. And heaven knows what kind of microbes are, are in the agricultural uh, material, uh, so, uh, so, so these workers got pulmonary disease. Uh, unpleasant work because you couldn't have any heating. Uh, you, could, you couldn't have a fire or a lamp in, in there because the big dread was that, you, uh, that the show, shows would go on fire and burn the place down, which quite, which quite often they did. There is the finished product in the middle uh, whenever you beat off uh, all, all the, the surplus vegetable material. Uh, that's, that's, the, um, that's the pure linen left. And it's, uh, it's uh, uh, they talk about people having flax and hair. Well, that, that's, flax and hair means like flax uh, because that, that's, that's the colour uh, the flax turns once it's scotched. Next stage is spinning. So again, you get a hank of what's now uh, uh, pure linen. And you see two ladies with the hanks and they're uh, uh, separating it out into threads. And the, the thread is, is made on the uh, spinning wheel. So two ladies uh, doing that. Uh, the girl on the right hand side, she's working on a, what's called a clock reel. So. Uh, the two ladies on the spinning wheel, they've, they've produced a bobbin of, of uh, thread or, uh, 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 and uh, so she's winding. Uh, the, girl, the girl on the right is, is winding uh, it, it, on her clock reel. That uh, produces um, 
uh, uh, um, a, a, a hank of yarn. And the girl who is uh, boiling stuff in the pot, uh, she's boiling hanks of yarn. And then if you look on the extreme left hand side, that is a hank of yarn uh, ha hanging up on the wall uh, to, to dry out. Um, this uh, uh, this uh, print, uh, I'm nearly sure, uh, represents a, a household in Balnahinch. You see the way the linen industry in, involves all members of the family. It, it involves the, the women as well as the men. So the men, they, they work the fields. Uh, but the women, they do the essential stuff. Uh, it's, it's all essential, but, but they, they do an essential job indoors. Uh, they they do, they do the spinning. Um, the two ladies, uh, uh, the th three of them are wearing bonnets. You see, uh, and the girl on the right hand side isn't. Uh, she's just bareheaded. So the, the the ladies wearing bonnets that that indicates that they're they're married ladies. Uh, so the, the the girl on the right is, isn't married yet. Taking a closer look at these. Uh, there's uh, two, two, two girls wearing linen bonnets uh, tied on uh, with, with, with a silk ribbon. And uh, they're very well dressed. They're, they're dressed up uh, Jane Austen style uh, with uh, low-cut low necklines. Uh, the girl on the right, um, she's wearing a very expensive petticoat, uh, which is quilted. Uh, so... Um, You'd want to show that off and, and, and tell people that you had an expensive petticoat. So that, so that means uh, she pins up her dress at the front uh, to, to let the petticoat be exposed. <coughs> As for Granny, uh, Granny, uh, uh, is, uh, she's operating a treadle on the spinning wheel, so she kicks off her shoes. But look at the shoe. Uh, she's wearing uh, uh, Cuban heels. So that tells you that uh, there's a lot of there's a certain amount of profit in the linen industry, and everybody in the family uh, benefits from it, and the women benefit from it, uh, and uh, they have they have an income and they they have uh, money to spend, and they spend it on the, on high fashion, including uh, Cuban heels. Now at the bottom it says that, that this uh, engraving was dedicated to the Honourable Earl, Earl of Mora. And of course in the 1780s he lived at, at Montalto. So that's what makes me think that uh, these ladies here, uh, uh, that, that, that Hinks when he was doing this engraving, uh, it says taken on the spot. So uh, uh, taken on the spot I take it means Balnehinch. Uh, and that these are, this is a Balnehinch household. Uh, these are Balnage girls. Uh, John Ward Johnson, who is Lord Morris' uh, uh, land agent, uh, he, he corroborates uh, that uh, ladies in Balnage were well dressed. The inhabitants of this parish, he says, are tolerably well clad at church meeting, mass and fairs. At the latter, uh, that is at the fairs, he says, young women are decked out equal to the ladies of the first rank. So he's confirming uh, that they're very well dressed uh, and that they uh, spe spend a, a lot of money on clothing. The picture on the right hand side shows um, uh, a, a Methodist meeting in Lurgan, um, uh, Whitfield, one, uh, one of the er earliest Methodists, was preaching in Lurgan and somebody painted uh, the congregation who were listening to him. So again, uh, you see that the, the ladies are, are, are exceptionally uh, well-dressed in, in Lurgan uh, at, at that period. Next uh, process uh, of pro uh, for, for the linen was the weaving. So you've, you've done the scotching, uh, you've done the spinning, you've now got the uh, thread. So uh, you, you string a loom. So the, the threads you have, uh, the, the top right uh, picture, you see all the threads hanging out uh, towards the right. Uh, so those are warp threads, uh, hundreds of them. So you string the loom uh, with, with those warp threads. And then the next thing you do is uh, put a weft thread through. 
So whereas there are hundreds of warp threads, there's only one weft thread. And the, the picture at the bottom uh, shows a, a flying shuttle, and it carries a single thread uh, through all, all those uh, warp threads. Um, so um, a web of linen is woven one thread at a time. Uh, so uh, a, 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 sl a slow, careful process. So you, you see in the 1700s, uh, top left, uh, a weaver uh, working at a, at a loom uh, in, in his own home. And he needs daylight, so his, his loom is, is parked uh, right, right, up against, right up against a window. Now, tell me how the loom operates. Tell me about warp and weft. Well, the warp is the length of the cloth and the weft goes across. So that's, that's carried over in the shuttle. And then there's a treadle underneath that lifts up these shafts. So that's principally that, it, that is how it works. So this is just the one treadle on this loom because there is the pegging system at the top up there. So I'm looking at hundreds of warp threads, yes. but actually there's only one weft thread. Each time, yes. Uh, which Coming is in. carried uh, on, on the flying shuttle. Yes. So the, the length of linen then is created one thread at a time. Yes, absolutely. Which is a, a, a slow process. Very much so. Mm -hmm. Um, I've, got, <coughs> I've got an illustration of the weavers bringing brown linen uh, to the uh, Brown Linen Hall in Banbridge. Yes. And they're carrying a web over their shoulders uh, in, in, a, in a, uh, a fabric bag. Wh what, what length would the web be that, that they were carrying to the market? In the early days, it could have been any length, but they, used, they introduced um, different sizes of widths and lengths, um, so a hundred yards is known as a cut, uh -huh. but if you needed the money um, you could have taken it off for 50 yards and that was known as a half cut. So if, if he wove a uh, hundred yards, how long would that have taken him? It would depend really on the, the width of the cloth and the weight of the yarn. Yep. The heavier the yarn, the, the quicker it will weave up, but if you're weaving with a very fine yarn, it will take a long time. So with, with damask, for example, you, you know, you could maybe get three napkins woven in your 14, 14, or 14 hours a day, and that would be six days a week. So you'd get maybe about 50 napkins done in a week. That's uh, hard the, going. <laughs> uh, those lads carrying the bag over their shoulders, uh, would, that, would that have been uh, 100 yards or, or 50 yards? It depended whether they needed the money. Yes. Uh, you know, if they needed the money, they would have taken it off for 50 yards. And if they needed, um, you, you know, if they could go on for another week, then it would have been 100 yards or, you know. So it's about, it's about is it what, 50 yards a week, you reckon? Yeah, well, De yeah. Depends. It, yeah, it just depends. It depends very much on the weight of the yarn and the, the width of the cloth. And the standard width w would be? For... And for the cambric, yeah. it would be about 40 inches or so. Yeah. Um, <coughs> now, when, uh, when, he's, when the weaver has produced a web, 
Then he rose it up uh, and he puts it in a, a cloth bag and he carries it over his shoulder uh, to, the, uh, to sell uh, to, to the local drapers. So you can see three we weavers uh, in, in this uh, uh, engraving uh, and they've come to Banbridge uh, to the market house. And <coughs> in the middle, uh, up on trestles, are, are the... Um, uh, <coughs> Uh, are are the are the drapers? So they're they're examining uh, the linen webs which are put before them uh, for quality, and there's quite a bit of competition uh, in the background. You can see uh, all the weavers uh, holding up uh, their webs and wa waving them in the air and and trying to uh, attract the attention uh, oh, <coughs> um, uh, of 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 the drapers. It would take, uh, a web would, would be about 50 yards long uh, and it would have taken a, a weaver a week uh, to produce that. Uh, so he's mighty interested uh, uh, co coming, coming to Banbridge to sell it and, and to get his money back uh, for his uh, week's work. So uh, uh, there's a, a blow up again. You, you can see the, the weaver carrying the web uh, in, in his in his in the bag over his shoulder, he's uh, he's got a big uh, hefty walking stick with him, so uh, that might be to make sure nobody nobody hi hijacks his linen. Uh, and then the, the line of drapers uh, all up on stools, uh, eg examining uh, the the quality of the product product, and the uh, <coughs> weavers all at the back frantically wa waving the, the webs. Um, that that was the um, uh, where where you, that was the brown linen market in Banbridge. Uh, there was a brown linen market in Balnehinch, and again, John Moore Johnson, who was Lord Morris' uh, agent, uh, I, 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 don't, I haven't got a picture of him, but uh, on the left is what I imagine uh, to him have, have looked like. Uh, so he said, uh, in Balnehinch, there is a neat linen hall here. Uh, and a pretty good linen and yarn market. On an average, it is reckoned, uh, to the amount of £300 weekly is laid out uh, for cloth and yarn. Uh, so a, a lot of money uh, changing hands on Thursday uh, in, in the, uh, 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 <coughs> at the linen hall uh, down Dravore Street or Bridge Street, uh, as it was called then. The linens manufactured in this parish are of a good stout fabric. So what he's saying is, if you're looking for uh, damask or, or cambric or handkerchiefs, <coughs> uh, uh, they're, they're not made in, in Balnehinch. Uh, you'd have to go to Lisburn or Banbridge for them. But that uh, Balnehinch makes linen. Uh, it, it makes the, the uh, stronger, uh, co coarser uh, uh, varieties. <coughs> uh, Johnson lived at Rockmount. Rockmount is still there. Uh, and, uh, and he called his house Rockmount. And the line of trees that you see uh, in the in the avenue, uh, he planted them. Uh, so uh, two hundred years later, uh, th those those trees and his house uh, are still there. Um, <coughs> the Lynn the Lynn Hall in in Balnehinch was uh, uh, halfway down Dromore Street on the left hand side, uh, where the fire station is now. So you can uh, where you see the tree on, on the le left hand side. Uh, that, that's where uh, uh, Balhinch uh, Linen Hall was. It, it gets the Linen Hall gets mentioned in history because uh, the Reverend John Wesley preached in the Linen Hall in 1785. On Saturday, the 11th of June, he said, uh, about 11 o'clock in the morning, I preached to, in, in the Linen Hall in Balhinch to a numerous congregation. Uh, so this is the, the first Methodist missionary. Methodism is in its infancy now. Uh, he's, he's the first missionary. He's, he's the first Methodist missionary to reach Balnage. Uh, and, and that was the date. Um, uh, Wesley uh, would apply to the local churches and ask, uh, could he use uh, the church? Uh, could he get into their pulpit? So when he, when he was in Belfast, he was allowed into Rosemary Street and he, and he, he preached there. Uh, when he went to Lisburn, he applied uh, to First Lisburn and he was allowed to preach there. 
Uh, when he came to Balnehenge and asked the Presbyterians, could he use their churches? <laughs> they told him to get lost. Uh, <coughs> they weren't going to allow any happy, clappy, uh, charismatics, uh, Methodists uh, loose, loose in their pulpits. Uh, so uh, he went up to um, Montalto and talked to Lord Mora. And Lord, Mora's, uh, Lord Mora was always very sympathetic uh, to the, the Methodists and often had John Wesley as, as a guest. Uh, so Mora said, oh, there's no trouble at all. Uh, you go down to the market house and tell them I uh, said that you could preach in there, which he did. Another use for the, sorry, uh, sorry, the, the linen hall, not the market house. Another use for the uh, linen hall was um, in the, in the 1700s, both Catholics and Church of Ireland worshipped in Old Mockard Row up the, up the Crabtree Road. But if you think of it uh, on a Sunday morning, on a wet Sunday morning, uh, it's, it's a long wet walk uh, up, up Crabtree Hill. So eventually uh, the Church of Ireland congregation uh, tired of that and they moved uh, down into Balnehenge Town uh, in, in 1772 to a new church on, on Church Street. Uh, and then the Catholics followed suit. Uh, uh, their new church on Church Street wasn't built until 1807, but they did move down to the town, and what they did was uh, hold uh, their services uh, in the in the Lennon Hall on, until their new uh, church was built. Lord, Lord Morrow's agent in Balnehinch was called John Moore Johnson. And he said that in Balnehinch we have a neat little linen hall. And the weekly market, he said, uh, uh, was busy with yarn and cloth. And the uh, weekly transactions amounted uh, to uh, three, 300 pounds per week. So if he's talking about yarn, um, af after the uh, flax was scotched and spun, it was spun into yarn. And then that was brought to the Balnehinch uh, Linen Hall to be traded. Uh, it would be bought by the weavers and then the weavers would turn it into cloth. As far back as, as I can remember, uh, this has been a Balnehinch Fire Station. And uh, thinking back, the tender then was a wee Dennis, uh, which was about half the size of this Volvo here. And the Dennis didn't have two-tone horns. It had wee bells on the top beside the driver and somebody had to put their hand up and ring the bell. So it didn't go hee-haw, hee-haw, it went ting-a-ling-a-ling. -ling. Now that's uh, the guts of 70 years ago that I remember that. But I want to go back uh, farther than that, uh, 200 years, uh, to about 1796. Uh, when uh, this site was the linen hall for Balnehinch. Now, let me tell you about linen. <coughs> this bit here is flax, and that's the way it comes out of the farmer's lint hole, uh, uh, and it's, it's full of rubbish. And it has to be scutched, and when you scutch it, uh, all the rubbish comes out of it and leaves you with the pure linen. So, at the far end of the town, you had the flax market. And the flax market is where Hamilton Fold is now. And if you look at the wall round Hamilton Fold, that, that was the wall of the flax market. So the farmers all, all uh, brought the flax there. Then it was handed on to the scotch mill. <coughs> it ended up with pure uh, flax. You, they talk about uh, flax and hair, so that, that's the colour of flax. Then that bit was handed over to the woman folk. Uh, and in, in their home, which was at their own fireside, they spun this here uh, on spinning wheels uh, into uh, yarn, in, into thread. So the whole family was involved. The farmer, he was, he was involved out in, out in the fields uh, and with the lintels growing the flax. The woman inside <coughs> were busy uh, spinning the yarn. Then the yarn was handed over to a weaver uh, and the weaver, he would uh, do a bit of linen uh, about 50 yards long or 100 yards long. So the linen trade uh, was very busy uh, in County Down uh, 200 years ago. And you would have known it uh, if you were here 
uh, <coughs> in the 1790s because every Thursday um, the weavers came uh, to sell their cloth uh, to the drapers and the women came uh, to sell their yarn to, to the weavers. And it was said that in, uh, every, in, on a th typical Thursday here, uh, about 300 pounds would have changed hands, uh, which was a lot of, lot of money in, in the, in the seven, 1790s. So a lot of people uh, going home happy uh, uh, after the transactions here, uh, uh, and a, a, lot of, a, lot of farm, a lot of families uh, and family members, male and female, uh, prospering. Now, <coughs> going back another 10 years uh, to 1785, um, <coughs> this, the, the, the linen hall was used as a church building and uh, the Reverend uh, John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, uh, turned up here uh, in June, uh, June the 10th, uh, 1785. Now, John Wesley was just starting off as a, a Methodist even evangelist. So this was the first Methodist sermon ever given in Balnehenge, and it was given on this site. Uh, John Wesley rode around uh, Ireland and England on the back of a horse, and when he got to a new town, uh, he would ask a local church, could they lend him the church? Could he get into the pulpit? So when he came to Balnehenge, uh, the local uh, clergy were not cooperating. They didn't want any of these uh, happy, clappy, uh, char charismatics uh, uh, co coming to Balnehenge. And the worst about the Methodists was they, they didn't, didn't use psalms and fa paraphrases, they, they sang hymns. So that, that was a, a no-no. So he wasn't allowed into a church in Balnehenge. So, so off he went to Lord Moira up at Montalto and explained his difficulty. So Lord Moira was quite fond of Methodists and he said, no trouble at all, you go down and use uh, the, the linen hall uh, for your service. So uh, s Saturday morning, 11 o'clock <coughs> uh, on the 10th, 10th of June, 7, 1785, John Wesley preached uh, to a large congregation on this site. Now that tells you that the linen hall was, um, had a large space indoors. Uh, and that wasn't the, the last time that it was used as a church. Back in the uh, 1700s, uh, the Church of Ireland congregation and the Catholic congregation shared Old Mocker Droll uh, up, at, up at the top of, of Crabtree Hill. <coughs> they took it turns about on a Sunday morning. Now, if you think about it, uh, if, if you're going to church on a Sunday morning and it's raining and Mocker, Old Mocker Droll is uh, a mile away, it's no fun wa uh, wading up that hill in, in the rain. So the two congregations got tired of that. 1772, the Church of Ireland, they opened a new, a new church on Church Street and it's still there. The Catholics, they took a bit longer. They opened their church also on Church Street, uh, 187. But in the meantime, uh, the Catholics asked Lord Moore, could they use the linen hall uh, to hold their services and they wouldn't have to walk all, all the way up to Old Mocker Droll. Uh, so Moore said yes. And this, uh, this site was uh, Balnehenge's uh, first mass station. Right, I've told you enough. <coughs> so just I'll leave you with one thought. When you're out on a Tuesday night and you're practicing at the bottom of the Lisburn Street car park, you take a look up at the Methodist Church, uh, uh, renovated by Jimmy Anderson in the, in, the, in the 1980s, and you think to yourself, Methodists, your show started in Balnehenge Fire Station in 1785. <laughs> Um, to give you some idea of the qu good quality of, of Irish linen, and uh, when we say Irish linen, we mean uh, linen made in, in Ulster and, and made, made in County Down. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, who was a founding father of the American Republic <coughs> and helped to write the uh, Declaration of Independence. In the run-up to the American War of Independence, he came to visit Hillsborough. Uh, to negotiate with Lord Downshire, who, who, who was in charge of the colonies. So Downshire wanted to butter him up. So he, he, he stayed for f five days in Hillsborough 
and Downshire put him on the, on the back of a pony and trap and t- took him all around County Down showing him the attractions. And one of the attractions was the quality of the linen uh, which was available. So Franklin is a world traveller. He, he belongs in Philadelphia. He spends a lot of his time in London, uh, but he knows good quality linen when he sees it. Uh, so over the course of five days in County Down, he spent £75 on linen and, and sent it off uh, to his housekeeper uh, in, uh, in, in London. Yes. The founding father of the American Republic mm-hmm. uh, spent five days in Hillsborough in 1771. Right. And he was negotiating <coughs> with Lord Hillsborough trying to avoid the American War of Independence. Okay. So during his five days, uh, he spent 75 pounds on linen. That's a lot of money back then. And uh, this was an, a number of parcels uh, that, that he bought. And then he sent them off uh, to his housekeeper in London. Right. Uh, for his own household back in Philadelphia, he only sent one parcel and it was worth uh, five pounds. Uh, and it was Holland. Oh, right. uh-huh. uh, so Holland, as I understand it, was uh, he- heavy duty linen, uh, which was glazed and had size in it. Yes. And if you wanted to make window blinds, then uh, H- Holland w- was the stuff. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to see the records for his purchases for his housekeeper in London. Okay. Uh, the message I'm getting f- is that uh, he, he's, he, he's a world traveller. Uh, he's visiting Scotland, he's visiting Ireland. But if he decides to buy linen, then the place where he buys the linen is in the Lisbon vicinity. Yeah, uh-huh. so, that, <laughs> so, so, so that that sounds like, like Lis- Lisbon is the, is the wor- world capital for, for, for linen. Well, it was very, very important here. Yeah, it still is, of course, but... Um you know, back in the day, the, the market was right outside this building. Yep. You know, and the people come in from all over the place. So, um, yeah, lots of money changing hands there. I, I'd love to know what kind of linen he bought. It sounds as if uh, Lisbon in 1771 was capable of producing a, a wide variety of linen products. So, so what was he buying? Was he buying sheets, handkerchiefs? Uh, <coughs> Uh, was he buying uh, night, night shirts? Uh, a bit be lovely, be lovely to see the de- details of the, those purchases. Yeah, well, it's not written down. It's it, it is, <laughs> it's but you, you, have, you have to go to America to see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was. A, it must have been a very noisy place, you know, with, in the market. I think with the weavers trying to get their webs sold, trying to get the best prices for them. Yep. You know, so it's, Interesting. Lively, I think is the way I would describe it. And the the um, the drapers they inspected the webs uh, oh, for, yes. for for quality insurance. Absolutely. Be- before they handed over the money. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. I saw a ledger one time that had a beautiful, lovely. What do we call that? Um, Script of people who copper copper plate. Prop ES, and it was all written in, in ink. And one of the entries was a scoundrel, no more orders, with this big score. <laughs> now I have no idea what happened there, but obviously this person who was trying to re- er, sell their, their web um, is not going to be back to the market again or anything. Maybe, maybe he was using cotton instead of, instead of linen? Uh, uh, who knows. Right. It didn't say what the problem was, but it was definitely a problem. Yep. Yeah, but, yeah, it's interesting to see it. Yeah. Next stage <coughs> in processing uh, linen was uh, bleaching. The picture bottom left shows you the linen as it, as it emerges from the weaver. It's a brown colour, uh, so then, then it has to be bleached uh, and uh, be turned white. So you steep it in uh, dilute sulfuric acid, uh, uh, then, then it was called vitroil. Uh, but you wouldn't steep it for too long, you, you wouldn't want the linen actually burned. 
But what you were doing was starting a chemical process. So you dipped it briefly in that solution and then you wrung it out. And you can see, <coughs> uh, top, top left, you, you can see the linen uh, being wrung out and the solution uh, wrung out of the linen. Then you spread uh, uh, the linen web uh, on uh, a bleach green. And <coughs> the chemical process which had started uh, in, the, in the tank uh, continued once you let it out on the bleach green. If you exposed it to the air, uh, then uh, it, the linen uh, and the solution in the linen uh, continued to absorb oxygen. Uh, from, from the ambient air and fr from the grass and then it would continue to bleach uh, on, on, on the bleach green. So you, you see uh, the bleach green uh, in the bottom here, the, the photograph uh, which is in Norris Trevor and then the bleach green in the, at the top is a linen hill uh, at Kate's Bridge. So Hinks included uh, the house linen hill in his, in his um, in his engraving, but Linen Hill is still there. Uh, a very uh, interesting house because uh, in 1792, uh, Wolf Tone uh, spent a night uh, in Linen Hill uh, as, as a guest of the lo local family uh, called Lowry. Final pr uh, process with the linen is beetling. Uh, the weave uh, was pretty open uh, and, and you could see through it. So if, if you put it through, uh, wooden beetles uh, and, and hammered it, then that closed the weave. Uh, it, it also gave the, the finished linen a, a nice sheen. Interesting that uh, terms uh, which we've come across uh, with the linen industry have, have entered the wider language. So cer certainly in the 1950s, uh, you, you heard terms like, you'll get a scotch in the lug, uh, son. Uh, so Scotch, of course, is a linen term. Uh, he, he got a queer bleaching, and bleaching is a linen term. Aye, they give him a right beetling. Uh, so the beetling is, is the last process in, in, the, in the linen manufacture. He's always spinning yarns, you know. Um, <coughs> in the at the end of the 1990s, Brum Henderson, uh, the chairman of Ulster Television, resident of Balna Hinch then, uh, commissioned a set of murals uh, about, about uh, Balnehenge industry. And one of them uh, was executed by Margaret Brand. Uh, <coughs> so this is um, pretty much uh, a, a, an imitation of the Hinks uh, uh, prints fr from, from the 1780s. Very clever uh, composition uh, where she has the, the man taking the beats out of the lint hole. She knows to park a load of stones beside the lint hole uh, to, to hold the beach down. Uh, the, the stacks on the left-hand side aren't haystacks, uh, they, they are flax stacks. Uh, on the right-hand side you see a field full of the wee blue flower. In the middle you see a bleach green uh, with the, with the uh, uh, linen webs bleaching. Uh, on the right of that, you have a little tower, which was the, uh, the, the watch tower to make sure bleach wasn't stolen uh, from, the, from the green at night. Uh, and then at the top, you have Linen Hill uh, fro from Kate's Bridge, st uh, straight out of the Hinks print. V very clever composition. <coughs> now, I'll, I'll talk about uh, the, the, um, how the industrial processes were powered, uh, whether by uh, water uh, or, or steam or wind. So let's take a look at uh, a mill at, at the bottom of uh, Church Road uh, in Balnehenge. Uh, you can see it's right beside the bridge, you can see it's right beside the, the, the Spa Road. Uh, so this is uh, Harris's uh, combined cord mill and flax mill. Uh, this pho photograph is taken from the uh, estate agent's brochure, 2018. He, he was selling it for 0.7 of a million pounds. So finally, uh, this month, I see that it's under offer, uh, and the complex might 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 be uh, might be sold. The trouble with um, anybody buying it is that this is a l listed building, uh, and you can't touch it uh, except to restore it. Uh, so it's going to, going to be an, an expensive affair. 
but uh, as, 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 as recently as uh, 2006, it was in full working order. So it would be great if someone bought it, uh, uh, restored it properly, and uh, sort of museum style, uh, get, get it back <coughs> into working order. Uh, you see it, it had two sources of power. Uh, there's the windmill, sorry, there's the water mill on, on the right hand side. And then uh, the colour photograph right in the middle, you see the chimney. Uh, uh, it was uh, uh, powered by steam power as well. Now, the, uh, Harris's mill has got a very long history. Here's, here's the Balanage Charter. Uh, uh, granted in 1683 by uh, Charles, II, Charles II uh, to Sir George Rawdon. So it says that uh, Sir George, by his care and cost, has become, uh, Balanage has become well inhabited. He having built two mills, put the parish church in re re repair, erected a considerable town, and the middle of it uh, set out a large marketplace. So, uh, George Rodden's priorities in establishing Balnehenge um, were to attract a population, to fix the parish church, uh, to uh, uh, make sure there were uh, houses built for the townspeople, uh, and set out a marketplace and erect two mills. Uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't run a town unless you had a, a, a corn mill. Uh, uh, the, the population wouldn't be fed unless you had a corn mill. So that was one of his, his first priorities. So he built, he built two mills, and we, uh, I know where one of them was, uh, and <coughs> it was uh, at, at, the, at the bottom of, um, uh, of, of Church Road. And there's a map from uh, 1797, and you can see the, the, the mill uh, marked on that. So it's, it's got a long history. Uh, a mill uh, has to have a specific location. It has to have a generous source of water. It has to have an area where the water can be dammed. And it has to have a steep drop uh, from the dam uh, to, the, to where the water comes out, comes out of the mill wheel. Uh, if you don't have a steep dr the, the, the bigger the drop, the more power is going through the, the, the water wheel. So you have to uh, uh, go around the countryside and ex examine the topography and work out where is, <coughs> where is there a decent river, uh, where can you build a dam, and where is there a, a, a nearby a steep drop uh, to, to, ins to install the water mill. So, uh, so um, Rodden uh, installed this mill uh, at, at the bottom of Church Road. Uh, but nobody ever changed uh, uh, that position because it was the ideal position uh, and there would be few enough uh, sites like that uh, in the vicinity. Uh, Rodden built the mill originally in 1660. Uh, we know that because the town charter says he built it. Uh, the cars uh, bought uh, the Montalto estate from the Roddens uh, about 1800 and uh, like the Rodens, uh, they knew that the, the first priority, if you were, had bought a town and you were trying to build the town up, you had to have a mill uh, and you had to have it in good working order. Uh, so the first thing that the, the cars did uh, was to renovate and upgrade the mill. So building on the left, uh, uh, built 1817, what they mean is rebuilt, uh, and the, the one on the right, uh, built uh, 1816. Uh, they mean uh, re rebuilt. <coughs> Here's what I was saying about the, about the, the, the source of water. So you, you have the Balnech River arriving on the left-hand side. Then it's, uh, if you want to know where the mill dam is, there's, um, uh, going to sneeze. Um, there's, there's the, uh, Mockerdroll uh, Bowling Green is on, is on the church road. Uh, so if you go into that Bowling Green and then keep going down in, into the valley, uh, it's down, down there uh, that, that you find, uh, uh, that, that, that you find the, the mill dam. So the river is dammed uh, at, at that point. 
Then starting from the mill dam, uh, there's a, a new channel dug and it runs right around the back of the hill. It's, it's quite separate uh, from the river and you can see it marked there, mill, mill race. And that mill race runs uh, right around the, the curve of the hill and then it hits the church road and it goes into a tunnel uh, below church road and it comes out on, on, the, on the other side of it and you can see where the mill race comes out. Uh, there's, there's the photogra photograph top right, uh, that's, the, that's the mill race coming out and runs directly to the mill wheel. So when, when the mill was, was working, uh, you would see Tom Harris, the late Tom Harris, getting on the bike, uh, riding up uh, uh, Church Road, uh, going, to the, uh, going to the Bowling Green, going down uh, to the dam and opening, opening the sluice gate and, and al allowing the, the water to, to run through. Uh, to, to, to turn the wheel. Uh, mill races, uh, there's a saying, running like a mill race, uh, so a lot of, lot of water uh, came down quickly. Uh, uh, quite dangerous if you, if you fell in. Uh, you stood a good, good uh, ch uh, chance, chance of uh, uh, being drowned. Um, <coughs> the mill dam has been a, a constant feature in Balnage. Uh, since the 1660s. Here, here's a painting uh, of Balnehain, 1760. Uh, shows Montalto in the middle sleeve crib. Shows the uh, Balnehain River, bottom, bottom left. And then mid left uh, uh, on, the, on the edge of the painting, you, you, see, you see the, the mill dam. So an, an important feature, uh, always visible. Uh, the cars rebuilt uh, the mill in uh, 1817. Somebody went along and uh, did all the measurements in 1850. So the wheel was uh, 17 feet in diameter. Uh, uh, the bucket was uh, 5 foot wide. The fall was 10 foot 6. <coughs> now this is what I said. Uh, you, you've got to build it, uh, you've got to build, build the mill. Uh, uh, on a steep incline, because uh, the bigger the fall between the water, between where the water comes into the mill, mill is, the bigger the f fall between where the water comes into the mill wheel and where it exits the mill, mill wheel, uh, that determines how much power is, is going to come through the shaft. So the fall uh, uh, out the church road was, was ten foot six. Uh, and two sets of grindstones uh, for corn. It was only working nine months in the year. Uh, so work that out. And, and the answer is it didn't, didn't work in the summertime because there was uh, too little rain. Uh, if there's no rain, then there's no water. Then there's no water coming down the river. None get into the dam and no water available uh, for the mill race. So um, um, mill, mill wheels were effective and delivered a lot of power, but uh, the catch was uh, that they, you only had the use of them uh, for, for nine months of the year. I took this photograph in uh, 2005, uh, so that's when the mill was uh, still in full working order. Now, it, it no longer ground uh, 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 flour for human consumption, but this was the local farmers <coughs> bringing in the oats that they had grown themselves. Uh, so they brought it, brought it into Tom Harrison and he ground it. Uh, then they, then they, they took it back home and they, they used it as, as animal feed. Um, <coughs> and 2006, here is uh, Tom uh, gr grinding the corn. Uh, a a de demonstration for uh, uh, a group of lo local tourists. Um, he's not using uh, grindstones. Uh, uh, the grindstones are, st are still in the middle and you can still see them in, in Tom's mill, uh, but he's, he's using a different mechanical process now uh, where he's, he's got uh, metal grinders. <coughs> um, so uh, beside his ladder there's a bag and then the, the uh, ground uh, meal is, is co coming down out of the chute ab above his head uh, into the bag. Uh, in, in, 19, in 1820, I said there was a difficulty that the, the mill wheel only ran nine months in the year. Well, you got around that because in 1820, with the development of the Industrial Revolution and steam power arriving, 
well, well balanced engine called steam power. Uh, so the, you installed the middle chimney, uh, and uh, it, it, drove, it drove a steam engine, and uh, uh, it it drove a, a scotch mill, a scotch mill. So uh, e even in summertime, uh, when you when you didn't have um, when you didn't have water power, well, you, well, you would still have steam power. The other thing was that if you were running a scotch mill, uh, I told you that it, uh, a scotch mill produced a, a lot of uh, uh, waste uh, 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 called shows, and the shows were highly inflammable. Well, if you're running a scotch mill, why don't you feed the shows into the furnace? Uh, and the, the enterprise would uh, become uh, self-sustaining. Uh, in the night, uh, progress didn't stop then. In the 1930s, the mill wheel was supplemented by an underwater German turbine. Uh, so uh, the, the, the Ballenhenge millers, uh, the mill was an essential uh, feature in, in Ballenhenge, essential for the Ballenhenge economy. Uh, if you wanted to eat, it ground the corn. If you wanted to uh, have an income from the linen, you, ha you had to do the scotching there. So the, the local farmers wouldn't export <coughs> uh, their, their uh, uh, corn to Belfast to be ground by Andrews. Andrews didn't exist. Uh, uh, anything like that had to be done locally. So uh, the mill was an essential feature of the Balnehenge economy. And the miller uh, had a steady source of income. So uh, when the miller was, was the McNamara's, uh, they, they built the, those nice uh, red brick uh, villas beside the mill. Uh, the, the McNamara's had a steady income and, and built those, those handsome uh, villas. <coughs> uh, the mill was constantly updated. Uh, if, uh, if, the, if there wasn't enough water uh, to run the, 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 the uh, mill wheel, then <coughs> they installed a wee uh, diesel donkey engine on the left-hand side, and it, it would grind the corn for you. So uh, the photo top right, uh, the, uh, the grindstones are still in the mill. Uh, n nice, nice a antique, uh, but but they're uh, no longer used. And then I, I told you that an, a, an advanced German technology uh, underwater turbine was installed in, in the 1930s, so it's uh, still there, uh, but uh, not used. Now that's water power, so let, let's talk about uh, wind power. Um, <coughs> in the Belfast newsletter in October uh, 1773, Lord Morrow inserted a, um, an advert and said that he'd built a, a brand new windmill. And <coughs> very well equipped it was, uh, finest technology, a new house attached to it and a, a couple, couple of acres. And he was going to lease this to somebody who knew the trade and, and would uh, run the uh, mill uh, competently. So windmills, <coughs> um, uh, the, the seals are attached to a housing on, on top of the tower and the, the housing runs on a, a, a metal circle and there's a little tail fin. Uh, so the, uh, the, the object of the tail fin is to catch the wind and always turn the main seals uh, into the prevailing wind. So that means <coughs> that uh, the housing on the, on the top uh, rotates around erratically according to what direction the, the wind is going from. So that means the sails move uh, and they, they can, they can, uh, the sails can, can find themselves on, on any side of the tower uh, with not much warning. So if you're a farmer and you're bringing a, a, a load of corn in, in a cart and you come up to the windmill, uh, the miller doesn't want you to get too close uh, to the sails uh, <clears throat> because you, you, you never know when the sails are going to swing around and uh, uh, t take the head off you. So uh, there's a protective wall around the base of the windmill uh, so that a horse and cart uh, can't get too, too close uh, and can't uh, uh, get, get into rain, range of the sails. So uh, at um, Bally Copeland windmill, you can still see the, the remains of that, of that protective wall. 
And in Ballinahinch, actually, if you look closely, uh, there's a protective embankment around the, the foot of the windmill. Um, the water mills only worked nine months of the year, uh, so you said, well, okay, you substitute with the, with the windmill. But actually you couldn't because the, the windmill had the same problem. Uh, uh, the, the wind didn't blow during the summertime. So summertime, uh, the windmill let you down and the water mill let, let you down. So th this is something which, we, which we're rediscovering. Uh, we're, we're using wind windmills for el electricity generation, uh, but you can't generate so much ele electricity in the summertime. The other disadvantage with the windmills is uh, they didn't produce all that much power. Uh, and uh, a water mill would produce a lot more power. So uh, you, you notice that the uh, water mill at the bottom of Church Road was constantly updated uh, with new technology, uh, but the, the windmill on, on Windmill Hill uh, was gradually abandoned. Uh, so, so that means uh, so somebody decided that, uh, that the, the windmill was, wasn't worth the problem. What was wasn't worth the wasn't worth the bother. Uh, you you were better uh, st sticking to the water mill. Uh, again, another representation uh, of the uh, uh, the mills in in Balnehinch. This is uh, a painting called the Miller. It shows uh, on the left Balnehinch First Presbyterian Church, uh, uh, built 1751. It shows the windmill. Uh, built uh, uh, 1773. It shows Mockerdroll Parish Church Spire on the right hand side, uh, 1772. So all, all those uh, th uh, three buildings built around the same time. So here, here's a farmer uh, taking his uh, corn to, uh, to be ground uh, up to the windmill. Uh, Lord Mora put uh, uh, money into the windmill. It's his capital that went into it, but he made sure he got a profit <coughs> because uh, all the farmers had, uh, uh, had a lease. Uh, he, he, leased, he leased the land to them. But a stipulation in the lease was that, that when, when it came to grinding the corn, uh, they, they had to grind the corn at his mill. Uh, so he, he, made, he made sure he got his money back. Another mural uh, uh, by Brom Henderson's group uh, showing um, uh, it's, it's called uh, Wind and Water, so it, it shows uh, Balnage Windmill uh, and uh, Mockernock Mill. Here's Mockernock Mill uh, built by the cars to the same design as they did in Balnage uh, out, out in uh, Mockernock. Uh, there's the date stone there, D, D car uh, 1820. And it's the same layout. You, you find a river, uh, you find a place where the river can be dammed, and then you find a steep adjacent hill, and then at the bottom of that hill, uh, you, you you put the uh, mill wheel there, uh, and that that gives you um, that gives you a big uh, drop, uh, and the bigger the drop, uh, the mo the more power goes through goes through the wheel. Right now we get on to the second half of this talk, and this is we now move to the 1800s. and. It's where the linen industry moves into the factory setting. Uh, so, the, uh, the, so far as Balnehenge is concerned, uh, uh, Drummondess uh, became the, the leading centre uh, for, for processing linen. And here you see a photograph of, of the mill still in full working order, 1954. Uh, a kind of unfortunate, it looks, looks fine, but uh, by 1954, the linen industry uh, in Ireland was doomed uh, and uh, the, the, the mill actually only had another couple of years to go. It closed in 1968. Here's the details. Uh, top right, you see Drummondhouse House. That was, uh, some of the managers lived there and that was the administrative building. Uh, in the middle, you have a red row, a, a row of mill houses. They're still there, still occupied. Uh, on the edge of the dam, you had the lodge. Uh, so I remember Jim Hart, uh, the mill manager, uh, living in the lodge. On the left, the post office. Beside that, uh, allotments for the workers. And then do you see on the bridge uh, a UTA double-decker bus? Uh, uh, Drummond House was out in the countryside. So if you wanted a connection, 
uh, to the wider world, uh, then uh, the, the UTA bus was a, a vital uh, link. So in Drummond you could set your clock by the arrival and, and departure of the UTA bus because it, it connected you, uh, certainly, uh, first of all, to Balnehinge. Looking at the mill features itself, uh, the block at the end of the mill was roughing, uh, so that was where you got the, the rough uh, flax in, and it had to be sorted uh, before you fed it through uh, the different processes. Drummond was a, a spinning mill. Uh, it, it produced uh, thread. Um, <clears throat> on top of the mill, you, s you see a water tank. And it, it's, it's in the top of a, a, a big scaffold, and you want a lot of pressure going through it. Uh, you think that that uh, produces a, enough water for the mill. It, it's, it's a drop in the ocean. Uh, it needs tons of water to run this mill. So the, the main source uh, is, is the mill dam at the bottom, uh, got governed by the sluice gate. Uh, so that water tank on top of the uh, uh, factory uh, has to be topped up uh, continually. You'll hear why. Um, it, the mill was self-sufficient when it came to uh, energy. It, it wasn't. He uh, didn't, didn't need. It wasn't on the electric mains. Uh, it produced its own power uh, with an engine room, a, a steam engine, uh, and uh, the furnace and the, the big chimney uh, t t taking the draft. Um, I've, I've marked where the dining room was uh, for the workers. Uh, the workers all brought their own packed lunches, uh, so they weren't expected to sit beside the spinning machine and, and eat their lunch there. Uh, uh, the, the machines knocked off uh, for, for a while, and then everybody left the factory and went to the dining room and ate, ate, their, um, ate their lunch in peace and read the newspapers because in the, in the dining room the, the management uh, provided newspapers uh, for, uh, for, for, the, for the workers to read. There were, uh, the, the function of Drummond Mill was to spin uh, yarn, uh, to spin thread. Uh, so there were five floors on it. So here's, here's the ground floor and it's uh, the carding room. Uh, so uh, carding means that you comb all the linen fibres uh, so that they all run in one direction. Uh, they're, they're not tangled. Uh, and then, they, uh, then the linen goes up through the five floors right to the top uh, through the different processes. The, uh, it's, a, it's a female workforce um, and most of the girls are young. Uh, so, so some of them are, are older. Some men in the, in the photograph, uh, those are the mechanics. Uh, the, uh, the, they, uh, there's a lot, lot of uh, complicated machinery. Uh, if it tends to bro break down, it has to be repaired immediately. So there's a mechanic on, on, on every floor. And then in, in the middle, uh, wearing uh, a white coat, is the floor uh, foreman. So uh, <coughs> the workers, uh, there, there's a certain amount of, ha of housing in the village but most of the workers lived at home and walked to work. Uh, so, so these were uh, country girls uh, from the Drummond district or Lochan Island or, or Drum Snad. Uh, so they, they started work at, at eight, eight o'clock in the morning. Going up through the floors, now we're on the, on the fifth floor, <coughs> same arrangement, mostly female workforce, uh, mostly young. Uh, small sprinkling of men, same, same idea. Uh, the, the, the men uh, were, were there to be mechanics. Same arrangement, the floor foreman in the, in the middle wearing his white coat. So this is the final process uh, of, of spinning. Uh, and this is where you put the uh, uh, thread onto reels. And then those reels would be sent off in bulk uh, to, to, the, to the weaving companies. So uh, a specialist mill uh, doing only one thing uh, uh, and that, that was uh, uh, spinning. Monday morning when she 
here's the management team and you have every kind of talent uh, on the management team. You have the pr uh, proprietors, you have the accountants, you have the managers, you have the secretaries, you have, <coughs> you, you have the mechanics, uh, you have the, the farmers. Um, a, a small, small management team and a, a lot of expertise and, and all, all of them uh, competent at their job. Uh, to give you some idea of the calibre of the management, let's take uh, uh, one of them uh, on the white coat on the right hand side, Ernest uh, Sanford. Uh, that's a misspelling, it's not Stanford, it should be Sanford. Uh, <coughs> so he fought in the war, uh, very good as a soldier. He sank, sank an Italian destroyer uh, using a British Army landing craft, uh, so that, that is quite a feat. Uh, retiring from the army, he joined Hearst as a, as a management uh, uh, trainee at Drummond S in, in the 1948. Um, <clears throat> once the troubles arrived, uh, he used his army expertise and he was promoted to major uh, in 3D UDR at Carrie Duff. Eventually appointed Deputy Lieutenant of County Down in 1988. Played cricket for Drummond S, uh, did, didn't forget his roots. Uh, among, among the workforce in Drummond S. Then left is, extreme left is Jim, uh, 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 Jim Hart, <coughs> uh, who was the uh, manager of Drummond S Mill. Uh, and uh, through, throughout the war uh, kept a, a vital uh, war industry going. Uh, at, at the same time he uh, was head of the uh, he promoted the uh, national uh, savings movement in Northern Ireland, and during the war uh, he was he was a, an officer in in the Home Guard. So uh, his days were filled and nights were filled. Um, <coughs> Drummond S was more than more than um, a, a mill, uh, more than a factory. It it was a community. And it, it included a farm uh, and they, 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 the, the, the mill owned 200 acres and they had a farm manager uh, who, who was uh, uh, Charlie Juan. So, so there you see uh, the, the uh, hay uh, being cut by a, a reaper. Like I said, um, Drummond S is, uh, is a factory, but it's out in the middle of the country. Uh, and um, 80, 80 houses belong to the mill, but, but bo most of the workforce live, live in the countryside. So you, you ask yourself, why was a mill, an industrial complex, built out, out, in, the, out in the middle of the countryside? So uh, we'll, we'll come to that. As a community, it, was, uh, it did everything for itself, including uh, schooling the school children. Uh, so the mill managers, they, they appointed the um, uh, school teachers and on the left is Mr Dixon and on the right is Miss O'Connor uh, lo looking after the, the workers' children. Uh, the Hursts were the proprietors uh, of Drummond S Mill uh, through several generations. Uh, they didn't live in the village, they lived in a, in a mansion uh, on, not, not, not far away. Uh, on, on the church road and they had a pretty affluent um, lifestyle running to having a chauffeur driven car and having a stable of horses uh, for hunting. The, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the yarn which was spun at Drummond S was, was spun by what's called uh, the wet, wet spinning method. The thing with the linen is that if, if you do it in a dry atmosphere, it'll break on you. Uh, but if you, if you spin in a wet atmosphere, uh, two things. Uh, number one, it won't break. Uh, number two, you can spin it much thinner. So how do you spin uh, linen wet? Well, you have a soaking wet atmosphere uh, th throughout, the, throughout the mill. And to show you how wet it is, <coughs> I don't have a photograph for, for Drummond S Mill, but this is a Drummond, uh, photo for Muckamore uh, showing the, the wet spinning method. So the girl who's uh, operating the, uh, uh, the, the bobbins, 
Uh, you see she's, uh, she's working it in her bare feet uh, because it, it, uh, anybody working in, in a wet spinning mill uh, found that it, there's, there's no point in wearing shoes because they, the leather shoes would simply rot. Uh, so uh, all, all those girls worked uh, in, their bare feet, in their bare feet. And you see just in front of her feet, then there's a channel in the floor, uh, and that is uh, to collect uh, all, all, the, uh, run, all, the, all the excess water uh, to run, run it off. You needed a lot of mechanics <coughs> uh, to uh, keep the uh, uh, machinery in working order. If it broke down, you were losing money. Uh, so you had to have uh, expert mechanics uh, on, uh, on site all, all the time uh, to do the repairs. You, you hear about mills being dark, satanic mills and terrible places to work. Um, Leslie Dawes from UTV did a, did a documentary on Drummond S in 1976. So actually the workers were pretty happy and weren't complaining. Uh, Peter McAvoy said he was paid two pound two and sixpence per fortnight and he thought that was good wages. Um, <clears throat> the, the girls tended to start work very young, uh, age 12 or, or age uh, 13. Uh, so there's a lady who started uh, at, at age 10 and, uh, and she worked for a total of 61 years in, in the mill. So it must, must have been um, uh, tolerable enough. Uh, she started uh, at, a, at, a, at a wage of seven and six a fortnight at age 10. Then she went full time at age 11 when she went up to 16 and six months a fortnight and she was pretty pleased with that. Lady in the bottom left, uh, she had five daughters and two sons, the entire family uh, employed in the mill. So uh, the, the mill families had close connections with the mill. Summing up about their, their working conditions, a working man ended, uh, earned uh, two pound two and six a fortnight and thought that was good wages. Uh, uh, children could start um, as young as 10 uh, or 12. Um, they would start uh, at uh, part time at, at seven and six per fortnight, then at full, they'd go full time at 11 uh, when, when they would get a, a, almost double their wages and get 16 and sixpence per fortnight. And uh, there were uh, employees who worked in the mill uh, for 61 years, so they must have been fairly content. And, and one, one family had five daughters and two sons um, employed in the mill. A mill had to be built uh, in, a, in a particular location. I said, why was Drummond's mill built out in the middle of the country? Well, <clears throat> the first thing is well, you had to have uh, a good supply of water. You had to have a huge supply of water. So there already was, uh, whenever the hearse arrived in the middle 1800s, there already was a, a, a linen manufacturing <coughs> at Drummond So you would have known about the availability of water. But the great thing about Drummond was there was a massive supply of water uh, at Macaulay's Loch, uh, two miles away. Uh, and the water arrived via the, the Cumber River. So I showed you the water tank on top of the mill and the, the dam outside the mill uh, and you would never run out of water because the dam was constantly uh, replenished from Macaulay's Loch. So if you go to Spa and head out the Donmore Road, uh, there is Macaulay's Loch. And uh, the wall you see on the right hand side along the road, that, that is a dam at the, at the end of the loch. And then <coughs> jump, jump the wall and on the other side of the wall uh, there's a manhole and inside the manhole is a, a, a me mechanism to open the valve. So uh, someone in Drummond decided the, the uh, dam was getting a kind of low uh, so they would drive up to Macaulay's Loch, open the valve uh, for an hour uh, and let the dam uh, in, uh, in, in, in Drummond uh, fill, fill up uh, for, for, for another day's work. That uh, Mac uh, Macaulay's Loch supplied a number of uh, um, industrial facilities al along the Cumber River and one of them was Silcox Mill uh, uh, at, at Relais. Uh, in the 
uh, 1970s, uh, John Lewis Crosby, who was a senior member within the uh, National Trust, uh, he got Silcox Mill uh, running again. Uh, so um, uh, uh, he, he, he left it in, in its antique state uh, and let, let all the antiques uh, uh, work again. And to show you, uh, uh, in Balninch, Tom Harris did away with the grindstones, uh, but John Lewis Crosby at Relay uh, kept the grindstones and, and kept the old uh, method of, 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 of grinding grain. Uh, um, so the, the mill in, in his time produced a whole meal of flour in small uh, bags for the for a retail outlet and larger sacks for the for the bakeries. Uh, bottom left, uh, he had the, the scotching stands uh, and could do a demonstration of, of scotching. Uh, I don't know if that would pass health and safety now because scotching was so dangerous. Uh, uh, at bottom right, you have a flax crusher, uh, so that, that is to crush uh, the flax fibres uh, uh, and make them more, more flexible uh, befo before they go uh, into the scotching. During World War II, uh, the linen industry in County Down got a, got a big boost. There was a shortage of war materials, including metal. Uh, so uh, someone came up with the bright idea of why don't you use linen uh, to, uh, uh, to provide a skin for aircraft. So the Wellington bomber uh, <coughs> was d designed, uh, it's, it's, it's entirely made of wood, uh, the, the, the frame is, and then the, fr the frame is covered uh, entirely with Irish linen, uh, co covered with dope. Uh, so it's uh, windproof and, and airproof. And linen is very strong. And the RAF discovered that you could rely on Irish linen uh, on, on a Wellington bomber uh, <coughs> for about five years before it needed replaced. The um, Hurricane fighters, they started off uh, using linen as well. Uh, but th th they discovered that linen actually was pretty inflammable. Uh, so they stopped using it for the Hurricanes, but kept on using it for the Wellingtons. Uh, during the war, um, 11,000 Wellington bombers uh, were produced, uh, all of them covered <coughs> with linen. So that is an awful lot of Irish linen. And <coughs> let, let you know uh, that uh, the, the linen manufacturer was, was a vital industry during in County Down during World War II. So um, prior to the war, a lot of your uh, flax uh, came from Belgium or came from Egypt. Uh, they, they grew uh, the best quality uh, flax, but <coughs> neither of those were available. Uh, uh, Egypt was closed down because of the war in the Mediterranean. Belgium was closed down because the Germans had occupied it. So, so you ha to get flax, you had to have a massive expansion of flax growing in County Down. So uh, <coughs> here you see uh, a, a local um, flax mill, uh, Dodds Mill. So uh, they're getting uh, uh, flax uh, in, in straight from the farm. So uh, for, first of all, uh, they, they stook it and make sure it's dry. Uh, and, and then they put it in, into, those aren't hay ricks, uh, those, those are uh, flax stacks. Uh, big, uh, big threat of fire uh, always. Uh, so you would never put those stacks near a, a factory building and you'd keep the, st the stacks well separated. So if one went on fire, it, it wouldn't burn out another one. And you, you see the uh, regulations uh, for to prevent fire uh, bottom right. <coughs> First thing the uh, Dodds did was wh when they got the flax in, uh, they took the seeds off. Uh, and this this uh, process was known as rippling. Uh, so if you wanted a crop next year, you better have you better have the seeds. Uh, so Dodds uh, saved the seeds and then sold those seeds uh, back back to the farmers. Uh, to, to plant uh, plant for the next year. Uh, 
under pressure uh, to produce more and more linen, uh, the the retting process of putting putting flax into a lint hole, uh, it it took it took two weeks. So uh, the Belgians had discovered that you could accelerate the retting process uh, by instead of retting uh, the the flax, uh, boiling it, uh, so p putting it into boilers. Uh, so you say to yourself, well, that's an expensive process. Uh, uh, that, that, that's going to raise your costs. But, but no, it doesn't. Because uh, after you wrap the flax, then you scotch it. And when, when you scotch it, you get shows. And shows are highly inflammable. So what you do is you feed the shows into the, uh, in, into the furnace. And the, and the process becomes uh, self-sustaining. Um, a lot of Ulster men... We, Pre-war, we're in Belgium uh, uh, as travellers for the for the for the linen industry, so they all had to get out and come come back to Northern Ireland. Uh, and a, a lot of Belgium managers of the linen industry they came to Northern Ireland as well. Uh, so uh, this method of boiling uh, flax uh, was introduced um, uh, by uh, uh, um, a, ma a man called uh, Ju Julius uh, Bevernage. Uh, a Belgium, uh, who came and introduced the t technology uh, to to Dromara. Mackey's uh, always working on uh, linen, linen uh, manufacturing. <coughs> they invented a machine uh, which went, did scotching automatically. So number one, that did the scotching much faster. Number two, it was safer. Uh, you you weren't putting uh, uh, hu human op operators uh, in danger. Um, it, to accelerate the uh, linen production during the war years, uh, Sir Graham Larmer, uh, who owned Ansborough mil Linen Mill, uh, he was put in charge. He was the liaison officer um, at the Ministry of Supply. So he was the one who drove the, the expansion of the linen industry during the war, uh, which is great, <coughs> except there's a day of reckoning coming uh, when the war is over and the linen is, is no longer uh, required. Uh, getting towards the end, now I want to talk about uh, Drummond as, as a as a community. <coughs> so uh, Drummond S was part of the wider world uh, when, <coughs> when uh, World War uh, uh, one, one came along. Um, uh, there were pl pl plenty, plenty of volunteers uh, from, uh, from the mill. So there, there's a list of those who enrolled in the forces in World War I, and three of them were killed. Uh, I've put a red star at their names, and there, there's their photographs there. So the, their, their names are on Balnehenge War Memorial. So uh, one, one of the dead comes from Drummond itself. Another one, uh, uh, Mac, Mac, uh, Rifleman Mac, McBratney, he came from Cumber. And Lieutenant Joseph Marsh, uh, he came from Tyrone. Uh, so that, that let you know that, that the workforce of Drummond S was mobile. Uh, they weren't all recruited uh, locally. They could come from farther afield like Cumber or even farther afield uh, like Tyrone. So in the linen industry, if you had the skills, uh, you could move to wherever you'd be uh, best paid. Um, <clears throat> the dam was an essential feature of the mill, but it was also an essential feature uh, of, of the uh, Drummond's geography. So on a Sunday when the, the mill wasn't working, the dam was a nice place to, uh, to put on your best Sunday clothes and, and go out for a walk around the dam. Or in hot weather, uh, it was a great place uh, for, for, a, for a swim. You see the boys sw swimming right, right beside the sluice gate. Um, Drummond being out in the country, needed transport, so the principal transport was uh, UT UTA double-decker. But gradually you had uh, pri private cars introduced, so here's many more standing at Red Row, uh, beside, beside a new car. Or McCubrys, uh, they had uh, a char charabank for hire. Charabank is some something halfway between a car uh, and, and a bus. And then to cater for the new uh, motor transport era, uh, Rice has built uh, uh, a new set, of, new set of, of petrol pumps. 
On the social side, uh, uh, the, the work, workers were very interested in sport uh, and they had a team of harriers and the, the coach uh, for the harriers was Johnny Boyd. Johnny Boyd was a member of the, appeared in the photograph of the management committee and he had a widespread rep reputation as, as a physiotherapist in Balnehench and, and Drummondess and, and beyond. Uh, <coughs> Um, uh, Drummondess has a cricket team which has been going for a hundred years. Uh, there, there it is, bottom left in, in its early stages, uh, playing on, on, on a very rough ground. There was a local pipe band uh, uh, as well. Now we come near the end. Uh, <coughs> the domestic linen trade in, in Ireland succumbed to uh, competition. Um, <coughs> The best flax was grown in Belgium and Egypt, so once once the war was over, you could uh, the you didn't need to grow the uh, the flax locally. You could get better better quality uh, from abroad. The other big problem was that the synthetic fibres uh, began to appear. Uh, Terralene came out very early, about eighteen uh, about about nineteen forty. <coughs> so once you got to the nineteen fifties and sixties. Uh, you had um, uh, s synthetic uh, 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 textiles uh, being made uh, and they were f far cheaper and they were a lot easier to manufacture. You just threw uh, a mix mixture of chemicals into, into a machine and, and out, out, out came a synthetic thread at the other end. So all the very complicated uh, skilled processes of pr producing flax uh, so suddenly they, they became much too expensive and uncompetitive. The other thing was that um, uh, the, uh, the, the Commonwealth, uh, uh, India and Pakistan, uh, they were starting to uh, produce textiles. Uh, Mackies were exporting uh, uh, textile uh, machinery to India. <laughs> the Indians loved that. Uh, they, they, they could uh, uh, manufacture the textiles much cheaper than we could in Ireland. So what, what Mackey's were doing was actually exporting the industry and uh, uh, th that led to the end of it in Northern Ireland. So the inevitable happened. Uh, there was no demand for uh, linen thread. The mill closed in 1968. Northern dairies, uh, they thought they might take over the mill and start producing uh, dairy products, but that didn't work out. Uh, so it was sold again in 1978. But <coughs> there are some mills uh, which survived. Uh, Guilford Mill or Mollusk Mill, uh, those big mills, are, <coughs> the mill buildings still exist. <coughs> but a, a lot of mills were demolished and Drummond Mill was one of them. Uh, so here's the mill under, um, de under demolition in uh, 1985. So if you look close, you see um, an, an, an orange digger uh, up at one of the floors uh, demolishing uh, the, the mill uh, floor by floor. So uh, the, the, the uh, down recorder uh, recorded the, the demolition. One of County Down's most prominent landmark, landmarks, the Drummond Mill chimney, chimney was demolished. And much, much amid much speculation, the other mill buildings would soon follow it, uh, which is what what happened. So um, the linen industry kept going, but only as a niche uh, luxury um, uh, uh, industry. So th th this is a, a luxury item, uh, typical of of the surviving industry, uh, and this was um, t tableware bought. Uh, for Princess Anne's wedding, uh, uh, and it, it was made uh, locally. But but so there's still still a, a, a demand for Irish linen, uh, but but now it's now it's a luxury product. Uh, it, it's it, it's not big enough to sustain the huge industry that it once did. So the linen industry is gone around Balnehinch. Uh, the the mill is gone. The village still exists, uh, the community still exists. Um, the mill dam is still there and it's still a feature of, of, the, of the village and it, need, it needs uh, repair and, and maintenance. 
uh, the football team and the cricket team are still, are still going strong. And the interesting thing is to note is that they retain uh, the name uh, Drummond S Mills for the team. So there, there isn't a mill any longer, uh, but, the, but the, the mill still exists. So I'll finish there, uh, uh, tell you that those wonderful pictures uh, of the early linen industry, the Hinks prints, uh, I found them uh, in America uh, in the library of the US uh, Library of Congress. Congress. Uh, wonderful prints that you can blow up and, and see all the details. Uh, for the photographs, the moder more modern photographs of Drummond S, uh, I supplied them by Jackie Carvel, the late Jackie Carvel, who lived in Macarlone, and uh, also by uh, Jim Hart, the former uh, middle manager. So I spent some time with Jim Hart and his, and his wife, Evelyn, both of them dead now, uh, uh, t talking me through all the processes at, at Drummond S Mill. So I, I hope you've learned something from that. <laughs>